I want to start off this morning by apologizing to our live stream audience because we've not had our video for the last couple Sundays and so we're working on it. We got the audio but we don't have the, the video so we're working on that to hopefully get that back soon. I may get myself in trouble this morning by starting off because I'm talking about meteorology, lazy. So I, I try to keep it general and trust Wikipedia on this. But meteorology is a, an inter interesting study. With modern technology, meteorologists can look at the very beginnings of storms thousands of miles away, and the very, very beginnings that don't even resemble a storm, and they can forecast what's going to happen. And it's fascinating because when you track the Atlantic hurricanes, these weather disturbances start off the western coast of Africa. And to, to keep it simple so I don't get into trouble here, they start off as tropical disturbances, very light uh, atmospheric conditions, and they turn into a tropical depression and into a tropical storm, which at that point has an eye, and uh, there's a rotation to it, and then it becomes a hurricane. And many of those storms are, well, several of them don't amount to anything, but many do develop into devastating storms. According to the National Geographic, it says that the worst hurricane in our country took place in 1928. It's called the Great Miami Hurricane, and in today's cost adds up to $157 billion. The second worst hurricane in monetary damage of today's dollars was, as we can remember, the 2005 Hurricane Katrina causing $81 billion. Now, notice there's a vast difference. $157 billion down to $81 billion. And then the third most devastating, uh, there's a 1900 Galveston hurricane. Now, there was two hurricanes in separate years in Galveston, but this 1900 Galveston was the third worst hurricane, $78 billion in today's money. But the Galveston hurricane killed over 8,000 people, and by some estimates, 12,000 people. Such seemingly insignificant disturbances thousands of miles away turn into such devastating results. Another category that we can look at is historians, that when major things happen, wars or chains of monarchies or whatever it might be, Historians can look back to the very beginnings of whatever happened that maybe brought about the war. Maybe it was a change in, in dynasties or uh, something that happened between two countries that seemed minor. Uh, maybe a person was elected or appointed or took over, whatever. But they can trace this back, maybe even hundreds of years, to where this all began and the, the impact of it. So today we're going to backtrack the life of Christ. Well, actually, we're going to go back before that. We're going to backtrack to what is it that led to the climatic, horrendous storm of Jesus dying on the cross. And so this morning, we're beginning a new series of No Greater Love. In this series, we're looking at Jesus' ultimate sacrifice for us. And we're going to look at what brought about his death on the cross, we're going to look at his resurrection, of course, on Easter Sunday. Then we're going to look at his a brief time on earth following his resurrection and his ascension. And then we're going to look at heaven. Now, I really don't know what that last part is going to look like. It's not a revelation. It's what is heaven like, as much as we can tell. So I'm reading the book now. I'm studying it, and hopefully we'll have some good answers for that. But we're looking at what brought about this climactic uh, turbulence uh, storm on the cross. And so today we're looking at brewing storm clouds. Storm clouds such as what started the hurricane that hits the United States, way over in the coast of Africa. Storm clouds that brings the undertones between wars and countries and the problems there. 
We're going to look at the early, the earliest signs of what was going to happen with Jesus and how he got himself on the cross. We're going to begin with the book of Genesis, chapter 3. We go clear back to the very beginning. God created the perfect world. He placed Adam and Eve in that world. It was perfect. No sin, no disease, no sickness, no death, no nothing. And then Satan tempted Adam and Eve. And they said, come to his temptation. They ate of the forbidden fruit that God had said, don't eat of this. And then the pronouncement, then God came to them and said, okay, Adam, this is your punishment. Eve, this is your punishment. And then he spoke to Satan, to, to the serpent, but he was actually talking to, the, to Satan. We go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, kind of obscure, but what God said was that I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, and he is going to crush your head, Satan, but you will strike his heel. There is going to be damage to my son, Jesus Christ, and all through the Old Testament, God and Satan were playing this, this chess game. God would do this move, and Satan would do that move, and God, God did some moves that were unexpected to us. I mean, we know that the Messiah was to come through the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation. But how did Rahab the harlot get in there? From the city of Jericho. She wasn't a Jew, but yet God still used her. And then there's Ruth the Moabite, the ancestor of King David. And so God was making his moves and Satan was making his moves and it's likely that Satan was making his moves in order to prevent God's son from coming. So all through the Old Testament, this, this battle was going, this chess game was going on that was going to lead Jesus Christ to end up on the cross, crucified. And once Jesus came, of course, born as a baby, from then on he, he started focusing on the cross. In other words, once he got old enough to understand his mission, he set his eyes. He set his mission of the cross. He knew what was going to happen. Early in Jesus' ministry, it made it clear that there was going to be controversy. So now he's in the ministry. He's kicked it off. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said something to his disciples that's kind of interesting. He says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus said he was going to bring controversy. He was going to upset the system. He was going to turn family members against each other. Good families or good people that followed him was going to be turned against the, the people in the family that didn't follow Jesus. And the ones that opposed Jesus would then oppose those that were following him. We don't like that kind of teaching, do we? We want to get along. And sometimes we as Christians will, will even give in a little bit. We shouldn't, but we do. We, we try to keep the peace. And Jesus said, I'm, I'm bringing controversy. I'm not going to bring peace. I'm going to bring the sword. He knew he was going to bring violence. And he knew that violence was going to lead to family members rejecting not only him, but each other. Then the battle intensifies. We go to Matthew chapter 15. Some of the religious leaders from Jerusalem, which was the, the, hard, the, the, the core of the religious center of the world, they came to Jesus and challenged him. His disciples were eating without washing their hands. Now, this is not sanitary things. I, I think we could all remember as kids, we came to the dinner table. We hadn't really washed. We had dirty hands and smudges on our face, and our mom sent us back to wash again. I think we've all been there. But the religious leaders had this, this law that they made up. Now, what you have to understand... Of course, we understand the law as going back to Moses in the Old Testament law. That, that God told Moses, this is what you must do. But then over the centuries, the, the religious leaders came up with their own laws. And one of those laws was that you had to wash before you could eat a meal. 
But it wasn't just simple washing as we would go to the basin in those days and just you know, get our hands wet, a little bit of whatever they used for, for a, a cleansing. It wasn't that. They, they, had a, they had a law that said there was a certain method, a certain way that you had to wash your hands. It was intricate. And so when these Pharisees came to Jesus and said, hey, why aren't your disciples obeying the, the law of washing before they eat? Jesus kicked back at them. Now, don't laugh. They had their traditions, and we have our traditions too. At least the, the modern churches today does. We, we have our own little set of rules ever so often. Yeah, I, I wonder if we, moved, if we moved communion, how many of you would be upset with that? If we started off the service or ended the service or, or some simple things that we would do, we tend to get upset when, when it doesn't go as planned, as normal. Well, I know that's not the same thing as what they were doing, but these Pharisees, they had their own laws and so forth. And Jesus wrapped up this, this teaching about the, the, to the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7. Jesus said, You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Jesus started stirring the pot. Jesus started coming back at the hypocr at, at the religious leaders. The scribes and Pharisees, they became more confrontational and, and when they pushed harder, Jesus started pushing harder back on them. And I want you to notice the brewing storm clouds. The storm clouds are gathering. It's not just a disturbance in a far off place at this point. That was the Old Testament. Now we've got the storm starting to form. So now we go to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now I know it's not Palm Sunday, but we're jumping it by a little bit because we want to talk a little bit more over the next coming weeks of Jesus and what led him to the cross. And on Palm Sunday, we're actually going to talk about Jesus' crucifixion. So we had to jump things in order to be able to do that. So when the week of Passover festival took place, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Now what you have to understand there, in those days, the king entered the city on a donkey. This was tradition that the, that the world would recognize when Jesus came in on that Palm Sunday. He is a king. Of course, they were looking at him as an earthly king. Jesus entered as the heavenly king king and when when he entered jerusalem the crowds were just going nuts they were late laying their 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 coats and their and palm branches and and all these things down to welcome king jesus into jerusalem and upon seeing these crowds the the pharisees became disturbed and they became upset and they complained to jesus we we'll go to luke chapter 19 verse 39 some of the pharisees in the crowd said to jesus Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. We, we go to John's gospel, because now we're going to, John inserts some of the thoughts of the Pharisees. John chapter 12, verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Notice the jealousy. Notice the jealousy that Jesus was getting here. They couldn't understand. The, the Pharisees couldn't understand. You've got this, this Nazarite, this, this Galilean. Now, what you have to understand is that Jerusalem was the Yale, the Harvard. Jerusalem was the center of religious education and re of all education in Israel. So everything that they thought about knowledge and wisdom had to come out of Jerusalem. Jesus is this, is this nobody from Galilee. He's a common carpenter. He's a common person. And here's Jesus getting all this attention. And they didn't get any of it. Do you see the jealousy that's starting to really take hold? And then it, it gets more interesting because what does Jesus do the first thing he enters in Jerusalem? Well, we go to Matthew chapter 21 for that. Verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. 
It is written, he said to them, my house will be a ho- called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, let's, let's understand a little bit of the, the situation here. People traveled from all over the world to Jerusalem in order to celebrate this festival. And when they traveled those distances, they couldn't bring their sacrifices along with them. So they would go to the temple area and they would purchase the sacrifices. And to that aspect, I, I think that was okay. But these were the money changers were making a huge profit. It wasn't just for, for helping the travelers. They were making money on it. And I think that's what really angered Jesus. Back when I was a kid, my dad told us, boys, there was four of us, he said, whatever you do, don't mess with a hornet's nest. Now, a hornet's nest is, uh, hornets are paper wasps like you see up in the corners of your buildings. But if you've ever looked at a hornet, it's, it's like it's, it's a paper wasp on steroids. Big and powerful. And Dad always told us, don't mess with them. Now, I've only ever seen one hornet's nest in the summertime because usually the leaves hide them. A few years ago, I was riding my bicycle out by the reservoirs and there was a hornet's nest in somebody's yard. And they left it there all summer. And the thing was huge until it finally froze. And then I assume they took it down. I don't know who mowed underneath that thing. I wouldn't have gone near it. But Dad always told us, don't mess with the hornet's nest. And here's Jesus kicking the hornet's nest. He's abusing it. And these Pharisees, their anger just boiling up more and more all the time. And this, this hatred rooted deeper, but it continued. We go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 14. Now, this is soon after he entered Jerusalem. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers saw, of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the king of da- to the son of David, they were indignant. They weren't just angry anymore. I mean, that, that was his triumphant entry. And then his, his oversetting, overturning the, the tables. I mean, this is, this is a volcano not only smoking at this point, the ground's starting to tremble. This is the volcano getting ready to erupt. Because Jesus is just antagonizing these Pharisees at this time. It's as though the hatred of the Pharisees was so deep for Jesus that the roots were wrapping around the heart, their own hearts. And the, and the roots of this hatred were just squeezing the breath of life out of their lungs. Back in Matthew chapter 12, we read, or it stated that Matthew wrote that the Pharisees were plotting to kill Jesus. And then later in Jesus' ministry, not long before the Passover, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, that angered the Pharisees more yet. And Caiaphas, the high priest, said, you know, it would be better if, if one person died than for the whole nation of Israel to perish. And so Caiaphas was thinking, we need to get rid of this guy. And he was starting to plot and plan. But things needed to come about. It still wasn't happening. The Pharisees were getting more serious, but it still wasn't happening. And Jesus needed to help them along. He needed to really bring these storm clouds together to start this hurricane in action. Why? Well, because he knew that his mission was about accomplished. Everything that he set here to do was pretty much wrapped up, and he knew it was time to pour it on. Let's get this hornet's nest really angry. So we go to Matthew chapter 23. Now, we're, we're in Jerusalem. We're not too far away from his crucifixion. And Jesus addresses the Pharisees. And he starts pronouncing woes against them. We go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. This is, this, this is like walking up to a hornet's nest and hitting it with a baseball bat and standing there to take the punishment. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He repeats that in verse 15. Then in 16, he says it a little bit differently. 
Woe to you blind guides. Verse 17. You blind fools. 19. You blind men. 23. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites. He repeats that again in verse 25. Verse 27. And verse 29. Verse 27. He called them whitewashed tombs, meaning you, you look good on the outside, but you're filthy, dead bones on the inside. Then we go to 23, Matthew 23, verse 33, he says, you snakes, you brood of vipers. What, what would you do if I called you that this morning? What would you do if I told, talked to the elders and said, you snakes? You brood of vipers. Or the board. Or you. I'd probably get taken off the stage pretty quickly, wouldn't I? And here's Jesus saying these, to, saying these things to the religious leaders. Jesus ratcheted up the storm to really press it. He knew it was time to die. He knew that his crucifixion was near. His ministry is almost complete now. He just had a few things to do. He still had a few more things to teach his disciples. He instituted the Lord's Supper. And then he washed the disciples' feet to tell them that, or show them your, your role is not to lead. Your role is to be servants of people. Now we have one more passage to read. He, he needed to explain a little bit more what was going to happen. We go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. Matthew confirms the prophecy of what Jesus made about himself. He says, I'm going to be crucified. And Matthew confirmed then that the, the religious leaders was going to get rid of him. From before God created the heavens and the earth, before time began, God knew what was going to have to happen. God knew that you and I were going to sin. He knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin. He knew that there needed to be a perfect sacrifice. He had this plan all laid out. He knew it was going to cost the life of his son, Jesus. And Jesus knew it also. Now, we, we, we've read quite a few different scriptures today, but we, we wanted to walk this path that God knew was going to happen, that Jesus knew he was going to follow. From the Bible, we know this, that no one took Jesus' life. Jesus gave his life. No one took Jesus' life. He gave his life. Now, now this is not the main point. This is the, the leading up to the main point, which is the next one. No one took Jesus' life. Israel's high priest, Caiaphas, wanted to kill Jesus, but he couldn't do it because Jesus had the power to walk away. Israel's high court couldn't kill Jesus because he didn't have to stand there for that nonsense. It wasn't even a legal trial. It wasn't Pilate that crucified him because Jesus even told Pilate, you have no power. It wasn't the guards that nailed Jesus to the cross because Jesus could have gotten up. Now you and I, they could have held us there. But they could not have held Jesus there if he didn't want to stay there. No one could hold Jesus to the cross. He hung there on his own. No one and nothing on earth could have held Jesus to that cross. He had the power to vaporize the religious leaders. He had the power to overthrow all of Rome. He had the power to come down off the cross. He had the power to put everyone through excruciating pain that had anything to do with his crucifixion. And he could have let you and me rot in hell. 
Rather, Jesus demonstrated his love for us by willingly dying on the cross. That's the main point. Jesus demonstrated his love for us by willingly dying on the cross. He orchestrated the whole plan all the way through. From before time with, with the, the storm clouds, the, the, the very insignificant clouds that were going to come together to, to form the storm. And then when he came to earth as a baby, and when he got old enough to know what his mission was, he, he started gathering these clouds together to start forming the very first parts of that storm. And the, from the time of his ministry began, Jesus had total control. He had total control over the whole thing. He orchestrated everything. Satan could not stop him. Religious leaders could not have stopped him. Pilate could not stop him. All of heaven could, heaven could not stop him. All of earth could not stop him. Nothing could stop Jesus from going to the cross except himself. His own father was not going to stop him. Jesus went to the cross. He, step by step, plan by plan, each, each insignificant part seemingly to us was all planned out, and he followed it exactly as it needed to be. And it was his love for you and me that held him on the cross. He willingly went, and his love held him there. Now, I, I, look, at, look at your bullet. Look, look at both points because I want you to notice something. They're not commands. They're not telling us what we need to do. They're not condemning us. There, there's nothing there that says we got to do this or we got to love each other. There's nothing there that says that today in these two points. The whole idea is of Jesus' love for you and me, even though we don't deserve it in the least little bit. The points, the idea today is of God's love for you and me, of Jesus' love for you and me. He loves us so much that even before he created humankind, Jesus knew what it was going to cost. No one can describe that kind of love. Why would he do it? It's ultimate love. That's all we can say. He loved us so much that he went to the scourging, as Marty described it. He hung on the cross. No one forced him. He stayed there on his own. What held him there? Not the nails. Not rope or anything else that might have held him there. It was his love. His love. Jesus had an undeterred resolve on the cross to save us because he loves us so much. Because of his love for you and his love for me, he orchestrated the entire storm that came to full fruition on the cross even to his death. Let's pray. Almighty Father in heaven, there is no way that we can wrap our minds around the love that you have for us and Jesus has for us. I don't know, Father, if we will even understand when we get to heaven. I, I don't know that. Because in this human body and with our human minds, we cannot completely comprehend that kind of love. But you knew from the very before the very beginning what it was going to take. Father, you're calling us. Jesus is calling us. He's saying, I loved you so much. I went through all of that. Who of us can turn that down that love? Who of us can turn our backs on us? Well, it, it, we, we turn our backs because of our sin. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that, that realizes that they're not saved, they've, they've never repented, 
confessed Jesus' name and been baptized and received the gift of the Holy Spirit and received forgiveness of sins. Father, this is the moment. This is the time. None of us are guaranteed the next breath. You give, and you can take that breath from us. Help no one to leave here this morning without you, Jesus. Without Jesus in their heart, without them in their soul, without them accept them as their Lord and Savior. And those listening online, Father, let them do the same. Repent, confess, and be baptized. Prick our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.